Good afternoon and welcome to the Asian American Mental Health Trauma and Healing Workshop. My name is Elizabeth Coleman and I will be serving as your moderator today. To begin, I'd like to introduce the AAPI Strong California program for any new viewers joining us today. The AAPI Strong California program is part of the National AAPI Strong Initiative led by the Asian Pacific Islander American Chamber of Commerce and Entrepreneurship, also known as National ACE. Together with our corporate and nonprofit partners, we are standing against the racial bias, discrimination, and fear that has plagued the AAPI community, including our small business owners. And how do we do that? How are we building up the community? Through the AAPI Strong California program, the Cal Asian Chamber will activate programs that strengthen the Asian American and Pacific Islander small businesses through the delivery of AAPI bias and cultural sensitivity trainings, technical assistance, AAPI small business data surveys, and advocacy efforts. I'd also like to add that today's virtual workshop was made possible by our sponsors, Horizon, PG&E, East West Bank, Ease, and in partnership with National ACE and the MBDA Coronavirus Response and Relief Program. Joining us today is Director Glenn Fuji with a brief intro on the MBDA Coronavirus Relief Program. Over to you, Glenn. Thank you, Liz. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Glenn Fuji project director for the Minority Business Development Agency, Corona Response and Relief Program. This program is operated by the California Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce and the MD MBDA, Minority Business Development Agency, is, the, is designed to foster the growth and development of minority businesses uh, throughout the country. As part of the provisions under the CARES Act, MBDA has dedicated several centers to support the businesses impacted by COVID-19. Our center is focused on supporting minority small businesses to sustain, grow, and pivot their businesses during the pandemic. In 2021, our center assisted and served over 4,000 MBEs with recovering growth in spite of the impacts from COVID-19. As a result of our program, services and resources, we helped assist MBEs to successfully receive $600,000 in funding. Despite all of the support provided to MBEs during the pandemic, minority small business owners faced unexpected challenges that our center did not anticipate. The issues of mental health, trauma, and healing are ones that our program has not addressed, but knew it was a critical issue for the sustainability and growth of the MBE communities. And, and for this reason, we are very grateful and thankful to have Hannah Lee facilitate this discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn. And before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. Today's session will be recorded and shared post-conference. If you have any technical questions, please reach out to me directly via the chat function below. We will hold off on answering any questions until the end of the presentation as time permits. We also invite you to participate in our AAPI Strong California survey that will be prompted at the very end of today's session. If you have any follow-up questions, please contact me at emerset at calasiancc.org. Now, on today's session, today's session on Asian American mental health trauma and healing will include educational information about mental health trends, stigma, and trauma experienced by the AAPI community, and also discuss future steps to access support, mobilize for collective action, and allyship. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Hannah Lee, who is an expert in developing curriculum and providing training on racial equity, immigrant stress, Asian American mental health. And she has also published and spoken at local and national conferences on these topics and has also served on the board of the Korean American Coalition. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Hannah Lee. Hi everyone, um, it is good to see you all, even though it's virtual. So um, I'm actually going to ask if you all are comfortable with that, please turn on your cameras. Um, I am hoping that today will be a communal space and so it'd be good to see your faces. Um, and there will be a time, I'll kind of go over this <clears throat> as we get closer to it, but um, where I'll invite you and your thoughts um, on 
what we're talking about today on mental health and healing. And so, um, yeah, we'd love to kind of um, share this space with you while being able to look at your face. So please um, turn on your cameras if, you're com if you are so comfortable with that. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> All right, so um, just wanted to take a couple of intentional moments to um, remember two women um, I'm sure you have all um, heard, you know, I, I am a little bit surprised it's not getting as much national um, media coverage, but if you all have been active on social media in any way, um, you've heard about Michelle Go and more recently, Christina You Know Lee. Um, these are two women who were murdered in New York City, um, and there's still kind of ongoing investigations, but, um, you know, I think as Glenn mentioned, right, there has been a lot that has happened since COVID, and, um, you know, I, I think at the crux of it has been um, hate and discrimination against, um, you know, specifically vulnerable populations in the API community, such as women and elders. Um, you know, and this slide doesn't encapsulate all of the um, folks that have been attacked and harmed, but um, I wanted to take a, an intentional moment to just uh, remember these two women who have been killed within um, about a month's time in New York. So we're just going to take a minute or so to do that. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay, so um, we will be starting today's time together um, with some mindful breathing. Again, just to kind of ground us, I know that was a heavy um, start and introduction to our time together, but um, yeah, so just kind of, I'm gonna be leading you verbally throughout this time, but I'm um, for kind of what you can do on your own. Um, just, you know, get in a comfortable seat um, position wherever you are um, and close your eyes if you so feel led. Just find a space where you're, you just feel grounded in your seat. Let this just kind of be a moment in, I'm sure, what is a busy day for you all. To just find some grounding within yourself. So we'll start by settling into a comfortable position and allow your eyes to close or keep them open with a softened gaze. Begin by taking several long, slow, deep breaths, breathing in fully and exhaling fully. Breathe in through your nose and out through your nose or mouth. Allow your breath to find its own natural rhythm. Bring your full attention to noticing each in-breath as it enters through your nostrils travels down to your lungs and causes your belly to expand. And notice each out breath as your belly contracts and air moves up through the lungs, back up through the nostrils or mouth. Invite your full attention to flow with your breath. Notice how the inhale is different from the exhale. You may experience the air as cool as it enters your nose and warm as you exhale. As you turn more deeply inward, begin to let go of noises around you. If you're distracted by sounds in the room, simply notice them and then bring your intention back to your breath. Simply breathe as you breathe, not striving to change anything about your breath. Don't try to control your breath in any way, but observe and accept your experience in this moment Without judgment, paying attention to each inhale and exhale. If your mind wanders to thoughts, plans, or problems, simply notice your mind wandering. Watch the thought as it enters your awareness as neutrally as possible. 
Then practice letting go of the thought as if it were a leaf floating down a stream. In your mind, place each thought that arises on a leaf and watch it float out of sight down the stream. Then bring your attention back to your breath. Your breath is an anchor you can return to over and over again today when you become distracted by thoughts. Notice when your mind has wandered. Observe the th type of thoughts that hook or distract you. Noticing is the richest part of learning. With this knowledge, you can strengthen your ability to detach from thoughts and mindfully focus your awareness back on the qualities of your breath. Practice coming home to your breath with your full attention. Watching the gentle rise of your stomach on the in-breath and the relaxing letting go on the out-breath. Allow yourself to be completely with your breath as it flows in and out. You might become distracted by pain or discomfort in the body or twitching or itching that draws your attention away from the breath. You may also notice feelings arising, perhaps sadness or happiness, frustration or contentment. Acknowledge whatever comes up, including thoughts or stories about your experience. Simply notice where your mind went without judging it, pushing it away, clinging to it, or wishing it were different, and simply refocus your mind and guide your attention back to your breath. Breathe in and breathe out. Follow the air all the way in and all the way out. As we go through our webinar today, mindfully be present moment by moment with your breath. If your mind wanders away from your breath, just notice without judging it, be it a thought, emotion, or sensation. Gently guide your awareness back to your breathing. As this practice comes to an end, slowly allow your attention to expand. Notice your entire body and beyond your body to the room you're in. When you're ready, open your eyes and come back fully alert and awake. The breath is always with you as a refocusing tool to bring you back to the present moment. I hope that was a good kind of mindful uh, moment for you all. Um, again, um, you know, we'll be talking about some heavy things today um, and mental health and um, how we can kind of move towards collectively into healing and action. And so um, I wanted to be really intentional with starting our time today with a mindful practice so that, right, you can always go back to your breath. I'll go always back to your body whenever it starts to either feel overwhelming or there's um, there are some feelings that come up for you in the process. So just to share the agenda for how we'll be spending our time today, um, as Liz mentioned, a part of it will be psychoeducational. So I'll be sharing a little bit about um, mental health trends in the API community, as well as um, what trauma looks like kind of in you know, general, but also specifically for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. There is a really um, awesome video that Calasian has created, and um, I feel like it kind of encapsulates the experience that Glenn was talking about in terms of what, um, you know, what how COVID has been experienced for API folks, and so we'll be watching that together. And um, yeah, we'll be going over some mental health stigma and what that means for our community, and um, to also talk about collective action and healing. And then I'll answer some Q and A Q questions, and um, if you if there are any reverberating ones after our time together, but I wanted to let you all know that um, kind of after each of these sections um, that you see on the slide, I'll be inviting your thoughts and your reflections as well. So just kind of um, as a before we get started um, prompt. Um, today is meant to be a safe space and an inviting space. So again, um, there will be, you know, an opportunity for you all to share because I'm sure that all, each and every one of you have, has joined this space because it means um, something to you, whether or not you identify as API or as an ally um, or, you know, the topic of mental health and trauma and healing um, feels like something that is personally or even professionally important to you. 
Um, so again, I want to create a really safe space for us to come with, you know, our thoughts and reflections. Um, and this may, you know, elicit again, some emotional reactions, but, um, I want it to be very clear that it's today is not a therapeutic space. And so, um, we're not doing group, group therapy to, to, together today. It's more of a, um, again, educational and sharing space. So, um, you know, as I invite you to be brave um, and to engage in this webinar as meaningfully as it is to you, um, just be mindful today's not a therapeutic one. Um, Liz will be sharing a one pager with you all that will include some mental health resources for both um, local to California and kind of national national resources for Asian American mental health specifically. And so please refer to that resource um, for, um, you know, if you feel that you want to engage in mental health care and um, access a provider. Um, so specifically for our space today, um, I want to kind of establish some group norms for us. And so again, because I'll be inviting your reflections and your thoughts on the topic and, you know, what is shared by me today, um, I invite you to be, to step in, but also know when to step out. So be brave in your participation, but also know when to respectfully listen. Um, again, because all of us are coming to this space with our individual experiences and personal connections. Um, use I statements. So, right, we don't want to speak for the whole um, or, you know, un like uh, assume for another person's experience. So, right, uh, make whatever you share um, really personal and close to you. Uh, respect others' personal space. Um, and, you know, obviously we're, sparing, we're sharing a virtual space. So um, this in, you know, the Zoom world kind of means emotional and psychological. So again, um, with kind of the, I guess, the prompt that and, and the acknowledgement that, you know, today might elicit some emotional reactions, um, you know, folks will, folks will experience that in all different kinds of ways. And so, right, kind of being mindful of that, of what's coming up for you, but also um, acknowledging and respecting that other people might be having um, a different kind of experience. So respecting their space emotionally and psychologically as well. Um, I always include this one, no advice giving, right? Like we're here to share a space that is personal to each of us for whatever reasons. Um, and so again, I think to include a uh, positive affirmation, like I'm an encouragement, I'm all for that. But again, we want to be um, respectful listeners of all the stories that are welcome, welcome here today. And lastly, I think good segue, um, yeah, welcome diverse opinions. Again, you know, I think diversity is what makes um, this country so beautiful, um, but it also makes it hard, hard a lot of times, right? And so what we want to do and cultivate um, in our time together is for the welcoming of those diverse opinions um, and know that that adds, you know, enrichment to our time together. Okay, so um, we everybody loves some numbers, so that's kind of how we'll start today. So just general mental health trends in the API community. Um, so suicide has been found to be the leading cause of death for Asian American and Pacific Islanders, even you know compared to other chronic um, diseases. And this is particularly true for those that are 15 to 24 years old. So kind of this um, you know big chunk of the population that are you know, considered young people, youth, as well as folks in their early um, adulthood. Asian men and um, adolescents are at particular risk. So Asian men, even when compared to white counterparts, are um, committing suicide and completing suicide at um, higher, higher levels and rates. Um, and this is also true for Asian American adolescents. Um, Southeast Asian, so again, this kind of ethnic break, right, because Asian American community is comprised of so many different ethnicities, um, but again, just a particular uh, shine on the Southeast Asian American um, group, specifically Cambodian and Vietnamese Americans, have um, particularly high rates of symptoms for psychiatric disorders, as well as PTSD, so for Asian American folks that um, do have a PTSD diagnosis, about 62% of them um, identified as Southeast Asian, and as well as major depression. Um, and API are also 60% less likely than um, 
than their white counterparts to have received mental health treatment. And so this is kind of over the lifespan. So developmentally, um, this is still true. And these statistics are relatively recent. So from the Health and Human Services from 2018. Um, and then zooming in more to kind of when API folks um, do, you know, access and utilize mental health services, only 4.9% of them, um, when they do use it, it's compared to all other even ethnic minority groups. Um, API college students report more barriers to accessing mental health care. So um, the kind of reasons for these barriers have also have to do with general reasons. And so cost, convenience, right? And so, and also negative attitudes or stigma against accessing mental health care. Um, and this is, you know, pretty common through all, um, all like all racial groups, but Asian American college students also um, reported cultural barriers. So, right, uh, this sense of loss of face, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well, um, but also family stigma as kind of being um, barriers to them comfortably accessing mental health care as well. Um, so, and when API folks do access mental health services, they're typically more um, severely disturbed than other ethnic minorities. And so again, kind of zooming in to, to access to care, so, um, or the barriers to accessing care, um, first of that, first of that is the pressure to be academically or professionally successful. And again, as we talk today, you'll notice that a lot of um, what I'm talking about will bleed in with each other. So we'll talk a little bit about stigma um, later in this presentation. Um, and, you know, I think this pressure to be successful um, has a lot to do with the societal and cultural impacts of um, things like the model minority myth. Um, but this uh, leads to the ignoring or denying of mental health um, symptoms, and then, of course, accessing care for it as well. And then again, the cultural tabu taboos of the shame and honor culture that is very um, grounded for a lot of, despite, you know, ethnic identity, um, a lot of um, sub kind of ethnic groups within the Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander community, as well as the collective notion that the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. And so there are a lot of beautiful things about the collectivistic nature of the API community. But again, this kind of um, notion that, you know, when, when your mental health um, is a reason why, you know, somebody kind of sticks out or is different from others, right? Um, there is this notion that um, that in its of itself, right, is a problem that like someone is experiencing kind of this individual um, deterrent to to healthy psychological states. And so, so this is kind of, so just wanted to wrap up with um, talking a little bit about the model minority myth. So in terms of like these barriers, why, why they might be present for API folks. So the model minority myth, again, there are books written about this. There are lots of scholarly articles, lots of resources out there, but just going to give a very quick short snippet, um, but it is this myth, societal and cultural, that um, kind of claims that API folks are a group that seamlessly integrated into the U.S. And so, um, you know, this myth kind of has both API folks and non-API folks believe that API members are industrious, intelligent, resourceful, and in control. And so when you, you know, see that part, right, about um, what the model minority myth is, oops, my bad, um, it seems like a positive thing, right? These are all positive characteristics. But um, I think what is so insidious about the model minority myth is that it leaves no room for um, struggle and hardship, which we know that all all people experience, right? Um, especially those with marginalized identities. And I think it's important to understand like the roots of the model minority myth. Um, so again, very, very quick uh, historical background. Um, I did a training on Asian American history and I think the recording is available for that if you wanna access more information about Asian American history. Um, but the model minority myth uh, stems from the civil rights movement. So when Dr. King was kind of getting a lot of um, national coverage and movement with um, equality for African-Americans, um, the model minority myth was used as a target um, for the movement of the civil, what uh, Dr. King was doing in the civil rights movement to kind of disprove, right, that just because you have a minority identity, um, that doesn't mean that you, like, have a hard time in this country. 
And so it was used by um, white politicians and um, fo white folks in the media to try to discount um, the message of the civil rights movement that um, folks with marginalized identities have, again, um, like oppressive experiences by trying to pit um, the Asian American and Pacific Islander community against Black folks. And so, right, this was still a tool to kind of uphold the majority culture and um, kind of who stays in power by undermining um, the, the um, act, like activists and um, folks that were really leading um, equality for African Americans at the time. And so again, as although it sounds like a positive thing to be known as industrious, intelligent, resourceful, and in control, um, kind of the reason for why the model minority myth had come about was because um, of, of its, you know, use for being against the civil rights movement, right? And so how it was used, the intentionality of like how these identities came to be and prescribed to the API um, population um, is, is an area for, for thought and consideration. Another part, um, because mental health has um, pretty strong um, and heavy stigma in the API community in and of itself, there's a lot of psychosomatization for API folks, and so they tend to seek medical support for psychological distress. And so they'll go to medical providers, um, their you know primary care doctors, with things like uh, like racing heart or I'm having trouble sleeping, um, migraines, headaches, things like that. But these are actually all um, somatic kind of manifestations of you know psychological and mental health concerns. Um, but again, like before API folks access a mental health professional, they usually go to their primary um, primary caregivers or primary um, health. Uh, professionals and they kind of find out after a lot of testing that there's nothing wrong with your body right and so that's when they start right like medical providers will start asking questions about their mental health and um, that's kind of how usually folks in the API community are become aware that they have a mental health you know concern to begin with um, and so Right, again, like all of these um, physiological concerns are also connected to mental health um, disorders like anxiety, depression, um, addiction, and other psychiatric disorders. Um, and this is another aspect of um, like what shapes mental health care for the API community. Um, it's culturally irres irresponsive therapy. And so um, psychotherapy as we know it, it has roots in Western Europe. It has, um, again, it was birthed from um, like Freud in, uh, in West Germany, I believe. And um, so kind of in and of itself, the practice of psychotherapy is Westernized, right? And, and that is a very big cultural conflict for a lot of folks that grew up in immigrant homes, right? And kind of have this dual identity, bicultural identity as both um, Asian and American or Pacific Islander, um, but again, psychotherapy, you know, doesn't, it, I feel like for a lot of API folks, um, doesn't feel like it honors the bicultural, you know, um, nature of their identities. And so that's been kind of a barrier as well. And so um, for, right, the West, um, what care looks like is talk, like talk therapy, right? Um, but for folks with more Eastern um, beliefs, there is a sense of doing, right? Doing to take care of yourself, um, whether that's in the physical or mental health space. And so that's been kind of a mismatch within kind of the mental health care systems as we have it here in the U.S. So, um, okay, I just talked a lot and this is kind of our first, um, this is our first prompt into um, just getting reflections from you all. I don't know if any of these numbers or um, the barriers that I talked about in terms of care, if, if it sounds surprising or if it sounds, um, yeah, like that's, that's pretty true. Um, it makes sense. Um, I wanted to kind of, again, give you all a space where you can share as well. Um, and please let me know if you need me to go back and forth between slides as well. But I'm going to mute myself for a couple of minutes and give you all some space to process this together.
And again, I'm a therapist, so I'm very good with silence. Um, so I'm going to, again, invite you all, but I am okay with silence. So just going to still invite you, though. Hello, my name is Trezel White, um, and I'm on the Behavioral Health Youth Advisory Board. I feel as if the first thing that the first thing you said was very surprising. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, I guess I can start. Being a child of the '50s, '60s. Right. Uh, one of my childhood memories is riding my bike in our neighborhood and some old lady in a car pulls alongside, you know, I'm probably maybe nine or 10 and, you know, calls me chink. Right. So impacted me in a great way. And it to this day, I, I think and I call it a yellow night complex, you know, trying to save the world. And I think it's because of that. Right. Uh, because of those early impressions as a child right? That I try to save the world. I don't want anybody else to go through what, what I went through. So yeah, I can definitely relate. Thank you, Les. Thank you for sharing that. Tara, did you want to share as well? Hi, everyone. There's, a, there's an echo. One more second. And I just wanted to refresh this door. We can hear you clearly, Tara. You're muted, Tara. All right, let's try again. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have been joining on the phone and the laptop at the same time. Um, I just wanted to thank you for all those who organized this. Um, this is one of the, you know, subjects that has um, kept me awake um, because there's just such an implosion of mental health in general, but in particular for um, our API community. Um, my name is Tara Eng. I'm with actually with Kaiser Permanente, and I'm with the Office of Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity. And I'm also part of this California Mental Health Scholars Academy um, within Kaiser Permanente, and I'm on the steering committee. And our focus is to work with um, the community um, organi um, organizations that are providing mental health services to our API community, and we're trying to partner in a way that helps build um, the pipeline and build the capabilities and provide additional support. So there's the knowing and understanding of the implosion and the urgency, and there's also being part of the long-term, this is long-term solutions, which is an increase in the diversity of mental health professionals. Um, and then the recognition of the cultural um, understanding and the implicit and explicit for, um, you know, race, ethnicity, cultural concordance, so that there's that deeper level of um, understanding. So I, I wanted to, A, be transparent with who I am and where I'm coming from. And then at a personal level, um, Hannah, it really resonates. I'm so happy that you called out the diversity of our Asian and Pacific Islander population. Um, because it is so diverse and it's so misunderstood because we are, you know, treated as a cluster monolith and there isn't enough the, of the cultural and geographic literacy to kind of break us down and disaggregate the data and I'm always struggling to get people to look at us um, not as a monolith and so I am a part of the diaspora of the Southeast Asians I'm coming in as a refugee child, about 10 years old, so less a lot of the time that you had your incident, I probably did too. Um, and so I'm originally from Cambodia. I'm ethnic Chinese and Khmer. 
Um, I did survive, you know, genocide, war, you know, displacement, being a refugee. And, um, and I am very acutely aware of relatives and friends and friends of friends who have who struggle with persistent poverty and the persistent poverty is also because of their inability to um, overcome their traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD, depression, alcoholism, gambling, poverty, all rolled up in one and it's that persistent cycle. And I'm just happy that we call that out and it highlights the distinction, you know, of the model minority, the crazy rich Asians with the crazy poor Asians and the crazy, um, well, let's not use crazy, it's just, I'm sorry, like, let me, be, let me take out crazy, but you know, the, you know, the different social economic disparities and inequities that persist and to get the attention to break that out so that we can see the different um, vulnerable and underserved community and to support them as they are um, struggling very badly, um, especially in the last several years. So uh, I'm going to stop. I, I apologize for taking too much time, but I wanted to just, A, thank you. B, Hannah, thank you for breaking it down to some of these issues by different ethnic groups. And C, to let you know that I'm part of the API um, community leader with my organization, um, trying to be uh, part of the solution. Thank you so much. Thank you all for um, those that shared. And I really appreciate, again, the, you know, personal and professional connections. Um, it sounds like there were some surprise, right, about some of these statistics and experiences. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, I think, right, I really appreciate, Les, like your, your voicing of your personal experience of discrimination, because again, I think there's a lot of erasure within um, Asian American dis discriminatory experiences, mental health concerns, right? And that all, again, is tied to some of, some of the things that we talked about, like model minority myth, right? And, and trying to be productive and hypervigilant of making sure that people that come, you know, after us don't experience it the same ways that we have experienced it. But I know that each and every, you know, API person um, kind of in this virtual space, you know, has an experience like that, that they can share, you know, I'm, I'm sure of that. And so um, I'm really glad, Tara, also that you, you know, shared that you're, you want to be a part of the solution. And, um, you know, there will be a space where we'll be talking kind of about what collective action and healing together looks like with, AI, API folks as well as allies. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm total, I'm sure we'll get to a more enriching discussion then as well. So thank you. Okay. So, um, this portion, I wanted to go a little bit deeper into the traumas. And so I think Tara did a really nice job of, um, kind of helping us to segue into this section as well. Um, but first, I wanted to start by sharing um, this new news for home video, and um, we'll, we can also um, kind of in you know totality with what we learn about trauma today, um, you know, share our thoughts on this video and your experiences as well. So I'm gonna max, I'm gonna play and maximize this. So you would think that as a millennial, I'd be better at doing this stuff, but just bear with me. I think this is the biggest it gets. Hey, you are here. 我是妈妈 应该帮着做做饭，饭我已经焖好了，菜也切好了，葱姜也准备好了，你就炒一下就可以了，好不好？嗯，就这样，有事给我打电话，好吗？嗯，好，再见。
Oops. Okay. Okay. So what is trauma? Um, and so how the substance abuse and mental health um, administration defines trauma is, is an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual or a community as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual or community, it's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. And so again, very, um, it's a very wide definition, right? And so it includes um, kind of all of these aspects of what it means to function well and um, be spiritually or emotionally, physically, and socially well as well. And so again, um, we'll kind of break this down into how to understand trauma and the types of trauma that are out there, as well as um, its applicability for the API community. So the types of trauma um, that we know are and, and will be relevant to our discussion today, will be historical, cultural, and complex trauma. And so um, there, the, in terms of historical trauma, this is understood as kind of a multi-generational exper multi experience of widespread collective suffering of historically oppressed groups and communities. And so um, examples that feel relevant today or kind of um, Na Native American genocide, African slavery, you know, Japanese occup occupation, those would be experiences of historical trauma. Um, cultural trauma, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is understood as the collective loss and violation of a group's cultural makeup resulting from a systematic assault on what co constitutes that group's cultural identity by an outside culture. And so this can be ind indirect or direct excuse me, but um, what kind of is most important to understand about cultural trauma is that it's perpetuated by an outside group. And complex trauma um, is a combination of really early and later onset um, events or a series of events. And it's, you know, uh, invasive adverse events that is of usually of an ongoing interpersonal nature. And so kind of the trauma that we typically understand it, right? So abuse, whether that's sexual, physical, emotional, um, neglect, ser a serious accident, domestic violence, witnessing domestic violence, community violence, bullying, natural disasters, war or political violence, and even some types of prolonged grief or system-induced trauma. Um, these kind of all plug into these different three sections of historical, cultural, or complex traumas. Um, but just to kind of keep the keep these buckets in mind as we as we move forward. Okay, so the effects of trauma um, is kind of in the most basic ways understood to belong to th these three buckets. So first of first is behavioral. So a typical. Um, 
behavioral effect of trauma is self-injurious behavior. So cutting, um, hitting oneself or burning oneself, so self-injurious behavior. Risky sexual behavior is another effect of trauma. Again, if it's, you know, more interpersonal in nature. Um, there's also chronic health effects of experiencing trauma. So um, Tara, you touched on this a little bit, but right, um, again, behaviors that are not conducive to healthy and balanced living, like substance, like substance abuse, so smoking, excessive drinking, um, reliance on drugs. And then again, um, this mental, this really specific mental health part excuse me, um, such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD is another chronic health effect of trauma and um, also functioning. So there could be um, relational or occupational, um, uh, what is it, deterrence um, to, you know, being able to show up in relationships and in occupations in a way that um, is meaningful um, because of the experiences of trauma as well. So this is kind of the general effects of trauma um, for all folks, but specifically for the Asian American community, I think what really stands out is um, immigration from tyrannical and oppressive regimes. So again, the Southeast Asian group that, um, you know, a lot of those folks have his historical and cultural trauma, right? Excuse me, because they have a disproportionate exposure to violence and um, unexpected deaths. And so a little bit deeper into that, so about 60% of Cambodian Americans and 48% of Vietnamese Americans um, reported that they have experienced either robbery, rape, or torture upon leaving their country. Um, and there's also, you know, outside of this, these specific two ethnic groups, there's also a wide breadth of research that um, suggests that chronic stress from acculturation upon immigrating um, has traumatic implications as well, right? And so um, I'm sure many of many of the API folks in this space, you know, identify as an immigrant or children of immigrants. But if you really kind of anecdotally try to understand that experience, a lot of our parents or even ourselves, if we identify as first generation immigrants, come to this country for the most part, not speaking this language fully, um, not having understood the cultural context of the U.S. fully. And so um, one of my mentors shared a really powerful kind of way to understand this, but it's, it's you become deaf and mute, and, you know, as soon as you land here. And, you know, it's um, to kind of learn um, from, you know, that space to becoming really well acculturated and really seamlessly um, integrated into U.S. culture, right? The, it's the process of what that even looks like or how folks um, even reach acculturation, the levels of acculturation. So in terms of the chronic stress that Im Asian immigrants um, experience in that in that journey and in that process, um, that can also be experienced as traumatic or um, have tr symptoms related to traumatic stress as well. Uh, racial trauma, and I think again, this you know it ties into kind of the video that we just watched and a lot of the you know stories that we've been sharing, especially with right everything with all the hate crimes that have been happening with um, the COVID nineteen pandemic. So experiencing hate crimes um, and or any discriminatory acts, um, this is tied to uh, anxiety, depression, and sleep disturbance, um, but also other symptoms like hyperarousal, hypervigilance. So right, like needing to fear um, where you are in public spaces or going outside of your home and that is right apart from kind of the physical um, health risk factors of you know contamination for, for COVID um, and has specifically to do with racial identity and I think that you know is telling a lot of um, Asian American and Pacific Islander experiences particularly now. Um, also with you know I think with racial trauma it, outside of discriminatory experiences um, API folks are known to be at higher risk for transmission um, because there is an overrepresentation of API folks in, in the es essential workforce. Um, there is also, you know, a, a lot of Asian American and Pacific Islander homes have intergenerational residency, so right, multiple multi-family homes, um, and Kind of also, like Tara said earlier too, the poverty and lack of health insurance. That is very true for um, a lot of low socioeconomic status um, API individuals and families as well. And so um, that kind of coupled with all the racial hate um, and again, violence that has been perpetuated against API folks with the onset of COVID, um, 
again, all of these kind of PTSD symptoms and mental health concerns like anxiety and depression, um, and even PTSD, I think is um, particularly relevant to our time. The last that I wanted to kind of touch on that I feel it, that is particularly true for Asian American folks are is intergenerational trauma. And so this is still kind of an emerging body of research in the field of psychology. Um, but again, it's just broadly understood as a transmission of effects of trauma within families and communities. And so, um, right, and this can look like distress of others, even within, you know, the API community, negative self-esteem, hypervigilance, and functional impairment. And hey, yes, on the subject of intergenerational trauma, and I know a thing or two about that because um, you know I came here when I was about ten, but we escaped Cambodia at around eight, so I was in the refugee camps for about two years, and um, so I'm the middle child, and I'm fortunate to be young enough to be able to assimilate, speak English without, you know, an accent and so on. But my older siblings who are in their 50s and 60s, you know, they have a stronger accent. They didn't get as much sort of, you know, American education and so on. But the intergenerational aspect of it is um, even if my nieces and nephews are born in the U.S., because my older siblings are still living in that um, you know, they still suffer from their lived experience of such extreme um, trauma. So we're talking about civil war, genocide, famine, displacement, and, you know, just the, the isolation of being new in this country, that there is this deep level of stoicism um, that my older siblings um, carry out, and that is that internalized yeah. expressions that don't ever get expressed and they do they certainly don't talk about what happened to us 40 years ago and sure. so like I know the word stoicism um comes to mind when I saw the the third bullet and I'm not a clinical you know therapist or anything but that's what I have observed and I also observed that with my friends who are like the grandchildren of the Jewish um, holocaust survivors Mm -hmm. um, so there's some parallel um, as well. And again, yeah. I'm not a clinician, so I don't want to like go any further, but yeah. that's what I've observed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, PTSD symptoms will, right? And again, you can be like sub, sub, like level for a clinical diagnosis. But again, like um, those symptoms will look, you know, similar. And and I'm glad you brought up that point because um, we'll we'll be talking a little bit about like what intergenerational trauma looks like um, from our parents um, and how that gets gets kind of passed down to us. I think that might actually be my next slide um, after our video, but um, we'll t talk a little bit about stigma and I think what the concept you're talking about, stoicism, I, I think will be well tied in with with that. So hang on, hang on for me, and <laughs> we'll we'll get there. Um, but again, so again, um, I'm going to share this, share a quick video about experiences for um, mental health for API folks, specifically kind of within the COVID trauma, or sorry, COVID traumatic times. Um, and then we'll, we'll make some time to get some thoughts. Um, but I definitely want to make sure we have time to get to everything. So we will do our best with the time we have. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? There are reports of dozens of incidents of bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Why do you keep using this? A lot it of people say it's China. racist. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China. A number of factors have led to the rise of anti-Asian hate. Uh, during this pandemic. One is obviously the inflammatory political statements of certain politicians during this time period. President Trump's blaming of China, his refusal to wholeheartedly disavow hate groups, and his encouragement of violence through rhetoric at his rallies and online have led to dangerous splitting and othering. In 2020 alone, it was reported that nearly 2,800 hate incidents were committed against Asian Americans. Scapegoating causes injury, conflict, and grief. The elderly Thai American man in Oakland who was shoved and killed in his driveway did not deserve to die. The Burmese American family shopping in Texas did not deserve to be attacked. And the two-year-old child did not deserve to have his face slashed. 
I can go on and on. Nothing is solved by harming the innocent. Regarding being a direct target of racial discrimination, this has tremendous insidious effects as well as toxic effects on individuals and communities that are targeted. Hatred is toxic to well-being. Being targeted by discrimination and power imbalances directly impacts perceived safety and belonging, which impact mental health. Actual fear of the possibility, even worse, actual experience of being threatened, attacked, cause negative physical and emotional reactions. When an individual is victimized by hate activity, it can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, panic attacks, nightmares, and depression. Research shows that the experience of discrimination, whether through institutional barriers or interpersonal interactions, such as racial slurs used by one individual against another, impacts health by operating as an ongoing stressor, causing progressive wear and tear on the body, which ultimately results in worse health outcomes. In addition, these uh, separate instances can reactivate prior instances of racial trauma in vulnerable populations, ultimately having a compounding effect. Asian American parents had been more reluctant to allow their children to return to in-person schooling because of fears of racism, potentially leading to mental health impacts. Some estimates are that one in four Asian American students has been bullied or victimized by anti-Asian sentiment during the pandemic. So no wonder the Department of Education has found that Asian American students are the most likely among all that ethnicities to not return to school for in-person learning. Recent research also suggests that discrimination may affect people through less direct means, such as avoidance of healthcare appointments or checkups. To address this head on, we need bilingual therapists, caseworkers, and outreach workers who approach their potential patients where they live, where they work, and where they conduct their business and daily activities. We need to teach them to identify practice and address microaggressions at the time that they occur. Please talk with each of your patients that uh, either spontaneously share with you their concerns or may have known that they've had these concerns in the past in an open-ended, culturally humble and curious way, asking them how they're doing and how the impact of these current events may be affecting them. The APA newspaper, Psychiatric News, published a special report uh, called Asian American Hate Incidents, a co-occurring epidemic during COVID-19. I'd refer psychiatrists and therapists to this publication for tips on counseling victims of anti-Asian hate. I'd also encourage reporting incidents to stopaapihate.org. It's an online reporting site run by uh, Asian American advocacy organizations in San Francisco. All mental health is cultural mental health, from neurons to neighborhoods to the world itself. As psychiatrists, I hope we can amplify our understandings of the social determinants of mental health and begin to understand the individual is not separate from their relationships or society. We are who happens to us and what we make of the happening. And we are all happening to each other. I hope we can make the best of this. The drive towards equity and equality begins with really active listening. And I think in the APA, we are in that stage of the solution. We can work together as BIPOC communities in solidarity to dismantle structures of oppression, including structural racism in our country. Moving forward, now is a historical and galvanizing moment and an opportune time for us to unite together to form solidarity, coalition, to advance equity and fight against any forms of discrimination, intolerance, prejudice, and systemic injustice for all Americans. Why do you keep calling? 
So two really powerful videos um, and hopefully just kind of a good understanding of trauma. Next, we're going to move on to um, understanding mental health stigma in the API community. And, and then we'll uh, move towards kind of what we can do and how we can mobilize together. So um, just again, brief definition, what is stigma? Um, it's understood as the negative attitudes and beliefs towards a group that creates prejudice, which leads to negative actions and discrimination. So again, this isn't specifically to mental health, but what stigma is just in general. Um, stigma is associated with the process of, for seeking mental health intervention is the negative perception that an individual who receives psychological help is socially undesirable, right? So the rhetoric of there's something wrong with you, or you must be crazy, or are you psychotic, right? Um, these messages that are pre pretty prevalent, particularly within our API community. So the effects of stigma on mental health, um, we know, is reluctance to seek help or treatment. Um, it's also tied to be to uh, lack of understanding by family, friends, or coworkers, so our loved ones and those that we interact with the most. Um, fewer opportunities for work, school, or social activities. So again, that aspect of right occupational functioning um, that gets um, undermined, as well as bullying, physical violence, or harassment, again, of not receiving kind of the help and support that is needed. Uh, inadequate health insurance and covering mental illness treatment. So we see this even on kind of a right systemic um, and res like resource related level. And also this personal belief that the, you know, you'll never improve your situation and the ways that you might suffer because of your mental health is always how it's going to be. And so um, again, um, I'll kind of skip over the parts that we've already addressed, but stigma is also very pervasive in cultural, societal, and communal levels as well. And so the first part, right, that's cultural um, is a culture of stress, as we've talked about a little bit before with immigration status and the survival mindset, right, that comes from um, a lot of immigrant immigrant groups that you just put your head down and you work hard and you know what what even is mental health what even is you know well-being or psychological health right like as long as you're able to get up and you know force yourself to go to work that is all you need to survive and so right um, a lot of first generation immigrants um, kind of the belief and thought um, and and the prioritization of just surviving right has really put um, mental health as kind of the stigmatizing topic that is that should be shameful um, and so I we I touched on this a little bit earlier but again this like shame and honor culture and saving face um, you know leads to a lot of API individuals feeling that I'm probably the only one that experiences this or feels this way right and um, if there is something wrong with me, right, um, they're, like I'm an embarrassment to my community, to my family, to my friends, right, and it leads to these um, perfectionistic tendencies, tendencies for isolation, low self-esteem and self-efficacy, which is, again, tied to even a bigger kind of, um, bigger aspect of what societal, societal expectations for API folks tend to be. Um, and so the second point with societal societal effects of st stigma is silencing and erasure. Um, and because of things like the model minority myth that gives no room and space for API folks to have these mental health struggles, which are so understandable, you know, with um, kind of the, their experiences, particularly with COVID, um, this leads to kind of this internalized belief, right, that we shouldn't have problems. We're like the, you know, industrious minorities, right? And so if somebody has mental health um, concerns, it's, right, it's this really um, outlier experience and, and a really shameful one. And so this leads to misconception of API experiences at large um, and um, also works on this kind of societal aspect where, right, the need for resources for API folks, um, such as, right, ethnic match and representation um, from mental health care providers who do identify as API as well, there is a barrier to accessing those resources um, or less support, right, for API ident identify mental health care professionals. And it makes it hard for API folks to um, have access and feel that they have empathetic care that really is culturally responsive to their needs. Um, I think on a communal aspect, um, as we've talked touched on a little bit before, our, the collective nature of um, API communities, right? Group, we really stress and feel that it's important 
that there is group harmony. And so, right, if there is um, individual distress and, right, like that, that means that I can't be the nail that sticks out or I'll be hammered down, right? Or I'll disturb the peace of other people that I care about or my family members, my parents, right? I can't be a burden on them. Being an immigrant is already hard enough, right? It's, it's understood to be traumatic actually with chronic stress of immigration. Um, and so, right, this individualistic nature of intervention in the U.S., kind of as I talked about with um, just individual one-on-one -on -one th one -on -one therapy, um, it might not be culturally, you know, adaptable to Asian American and Pacific Islander folks that really stresses this, this importance of, well, I want, I want to be well, but I also want my community and family to be well too. So, um, right, the effects of stigma are, again, really insidious on a lot of different levels. Okay, so um, that was a lot of heaviness, and that was a lot of right. Um, this is what this is. This might be what is going wrong. But what does collective action and healing look like? So, in terms of again giving a short definition, collective action refers to um, the acts taken by a group of people who share a common goal of challenging inequality, exclusion, and injustice rooted in societal beliefs and behaviors. And so, this is kind of the space where I want to invite, really intentionally invite our allies into this conversation, um, right? And because Real, you know, achieving, you know, social justice and achieving wellness and health and well-being for all, you know, it, it involves all of us. So what, in terms of what research says about the importance of um, communal action is it's been found that social support and, you know, providing spaces for conversations like even today, right, about perfectionism, emotional suppression, um, isolation, intergenerational conflict, it's it, it's really needed, you know, in, in these safe spaces so that we're able to learn together, talk to one another, share stories. Um, and also, right, it's really important on a communal level that we increase mental health literacy. Um, through psychoeducation that also honors and preserves confidential confidentiality and culture. And so again, right, um, creating creating safe spaces for conversations that are meaningful and destigmatizes mental health and you know um, allows folks to know that it's okay that you experience this distress. In fact, you know, isn't it more than understandable that um, with everything that the API community has gone through, not just right recently because of COVID, but right, xenophobia and racism and discrimination has been a thread um, that, you know, the, and foundation that the U.S. has been kind of built on. And so how do we challenge that? And so, and, and it's by having conversations like this and, and destigmatizing mental health and setting um, kind of this understanding and, but also confidential space um, to address these issues. On a systemic level, uh, what collective action looks like is advocacy, really, and this is where, right, the invitation for allies, too, is for push for ethnic match with counselors and universities um, and clinical settings, right, API folks more than um, all other ethnic and racial groups um, really feel that having another API, you know, mental health clinician is an important like protective factor for treatment retention and even access to care. So just this, yeah, again, advocacy work related to having more API identifying folks in clinical settings and in university counseling settings um, so that they're able to receive the culturally competent mental health care that they need um, and would, would benefit from. Um, also civic engagement regarding the expansion and access to resources, right? So like with all the things that we've learned even today, um, what can we do, right? And so this may look like, you know, calling and contacting your local state representatives, um, right? And the, like for folks that represent your constituency and engaging them in a conversation about the importance of expanding um, the access to resources for bicultural, uh, again, mental health clinicians or um, having, you know, further like language which services for um, mental, mental health resources for folks that right, uh, might not be 100% fluent in English. Um, and also just this recognition that larger systems such as racism, classism, and other forms of discrimination, um, particularly right in the COVID era that we're going through, needs to be dismantled for general wellness, right? And so whether that looks like contacting your um, local state representatives or right, uh, uh, getting involved in your companies or um, you know whatever kind of professional and academic spaces that you all are in um, to, to really push for that. I think that, you know, looks really different for all of us, how we engage. But again, the systemic level is really important. 
important as well for all of us to kind of move to move towards healing together. But um, I'm curious, and, and I know this question kind of outlines just what does collective action regarding mental health for the Asian American community, if you identify as an ally, and within the, within the API community, if you identify as the API, look like to you. But um, I also wanted to provide a general kind of sharing space for everyone um, in terms of the videos we watch, learning about stigma and trauma as well. Um, I know we've heard from a couple of folks, but... Uh, I, I'm not seeing lots of faces, but I wanted to invite those that haven't shared yet to, um, yeah, share any reflections or answer this kind of prompt um, with us um, and engage in the space together. And like I said, I'm very good with silence, and so I'm happy with waiting, but yeah, just wanted to invite you to participate bravely. So let's try to hear from some folks that haven't shared yet today. Hi, um, can you hear me? Um, my name is Dorothy Sang. I'm um, from the Mental Health Association for Chinese Communities. Um, within our uh, Chinese communities, we also have, like, including the AAPI too. And um, I just uh, give an example uh, during this pandemic with the um, Asian hate crime increase. And then um, we, we have the volunteers like, joining the um, Toysan, Oakland, Chinatown pet volunteer patrol team. And then um, we have established that for uh, the purpose of trying to help the police. I mean, we're not police, we are not in law enforcement, but um, we try to lay, um, uh, try to get uh, people to, especially uh, people in Oakland, to understand that um, we can stand up to tell people how do we feel and how uh, how how the um, Asian hate crime like affecting our daily life, as you can see in the daily report, the, the news report is regarding um, there's so many um, innocents die from or like being hurt uh, without any reason. But of course, um, we 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 try to uh, helping uh, like uh, the the residents in Oakland to um, be aware that it is uh, important to uh, come out to, to, to stand up for themselves. And also, um, we also provide training for them to, uh, when you report to the police, uh, we have some instruction for them, like um, how, how can you report like, effectively with the, the information that they need in order to get the better result. And also as you, um, I'm not sure that you, you folks under, uh, know about the rate of the report in the uh, police department that not many Asian uh, report uh, the hate crime incidents. So it, it kind of like accelerate that the, the number of um, resources provided by the county or like the city that they will not take it seriously because the, there's not much report. Yeah, I, I just um, in in that uh, level in uh, Oakland Chinatown that I just uh, speak up a little bit. Just let you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. You sound like a great resource, Dorothy. Thank you for the work that you do. Hi, Hannah. Hi, um, my name is Jim Tabuchi, and um, I, I work with uh, an organization that um, his, is historically Asian American. Um, I've also worked with the Asian um, Asian Pacific uh, Chamber of Commerce as well. Um, I, I guess my my question or an observation in all of this is that um, if the focus is is on API strong, then what's the opposite of that, right? It, it's basically API weak, right? And and what I, what I think about is, is this stereotypical uh, Asia Pacific Islander where it, it is about being meek and turn the other cheek and being a victim, right? Um, where, where does being strong and, and defending ourselves come into play? And I just reflect on my upbringing, you know, um, my, my parents and grandparents were subjected to the um, internment camps, Japanese-American internment camps. And uh, they were not able to defend themselves because they were looking down the barrel of a gun, right? 
Um, in, in my case, yeah, growing up, uh, definitely was picked on for being Asian. And, you know, if you, the people who know me on this call know I'm, I'm not a big guy. I'm not a tall guy. I'm not, I'm not that big. Right. But, um, I, I gotta say, you know, Bruce Lee saved me from so many different fights, right? <laughs> I can recall people just saying, you know, be careful of him. He might, he might know Kung Fu. Right. Um, but, but I was picked on. Right. And uh, the two times that I can remember, I, I actually got in fights. And, and yeah, I, I got bruised up a little bit. I ended up bruising them up. But um, I, I actually don't have trauma from that because I know that I stuck up for myself and I defended myself. And, um, and I wasn't picked on anymore after that, right? And so I'm just kind of looking for um for for where that might fit within mental health um i, I also will say that uh, i'm a i'm a huge fan of the hollaback and, and i've taken all their courses and i've actually broken up fights and have um, been a been an active bystander in situations um but i'm really looking at you know the the possibility of defending ourselves defending each other within the api community so that in effect, we are seen as a API strong. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jim. I, I think you, you know, touched on a really strengths-based approach, right? And so I think that's kind of right what collective action looks like, I think, right? And this is a more of a, I, I was hoping that this would be kind of a brainstorming um, and again, like, right, um, people con contributing and collaborating to what it looks like. So I'm going to actually toss that back to you. What do you, what do you think, right? And it sounds like you've done some um, really good bystander work as well as, right, some personal examples of standing up for yourself, but what does it mean for you? to be api strong yeah um for me personally it means being prepared right it's it's um i, I have gone through um all of the the bystander training um i have practiced it um i, I view it's kind of like you know it, it's it's a form of self-defense and um and and you're not going to be attacked physically by somebody and say oh i better learn you know, self-defense now. I better learn karate right instantly, right? Um, you have to prepare for it well in advance. So, so internally, I've gone through, you know, scenarios just personally about what if someone were to call me something very offensive? Or what if someone were to um, physically push me or attack me, right? What would be my response? Um, and, and to go through that well in advance of anything like that happening. Um, Likewise, I've gone through it, you know, what if I were to see this in my community and, and would I be prepared? And, and I, I think I would be prepared because I've gone through the scenarios in my mind already. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily catch me off guard. But, but to me, it really is that kind of preparedness so that, um, you know, personally, I may not be physically that strong, but I can be a, a strong advocate and a bystander for others who are around and maybe together we can be stronger together. Yeah, I think those are really awesome reflections. And I'm, I'm going to tie a little bit of what you and Dorothy both said, right? It's this, it's the first like access to resources. And again, kind of in our takeaway section, because um, I want to give some time for other folks to share too, but, um, you know, it's the access to resources, right? And so, right, like, I think Dorothy mentioned a really great resource. So when you are reporting, maybe, and you need the law enforcement to get involved, what that looks like, right? And it is, again, like you mentioned, Jim, um, collective action. What, what does that look like to do that? with other people so that it's not a fight that you're fighting on your own, right? And then I think for our allies, it is kind of this increase in, um, and if you don't identify as Asian American or Pacific Islander, it's to know, right, the mental health experiences of API identi and identifying folks and um, doing this work together, whether it's that it, it's our allies that get involved, right, in, in, in those high tense um, or difficult uh, interaction, interpersonal interactions, or being a good bystander. And I wanted to not touch on those things specifically in this training, because again, we had a, we kind of had like a whole nother one on Asian American, like, hey, and again, like effective bystander, the one that we did before this. Um, but I think those are really good things that you and Dorothy both um, kind of mentioned. So in the interest of 
time. I, again, I wanted to invite some other folks that haven't shared yet. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, you bring up a good point, Jim, like what does, yeah, what does collective action and what does being, right, um, API strong look like for you? Hi, Hannah. Hi, everyone. If I can chime in. Um, I think the best thing as an ally myself that I can do is, of course, join spaces where I can educate myself and I can and I can learn what's going on, right? Um, I think from and then from there, taking that further and and really speaking to my friends, my family, and being able to you know educate them as well, and and really reminding people. I think the obvious, right, is we are you know we go through, right, if I myself, I'm going through, you know, my own mental health, you know, um, issues, you know, right, I can highlight that, you know, if I'm going through that, why is it that, you know, um, why is it that other people might think that AAPI don't go through that, right, and kind of drawing the, that common ground, you know, hey, if we're experiencing this, if we feel like this, what do you think, you know, um, our Hispanic brothers and sisters, Asian brothers and sisters, or our Black community is feeling. Why is it that that only applies to you, but not to our other minority communities, right? So I think that's one way that I can also, you know, help um, within collective action on, on my behalf and, and, you know, continue to share that and, and try to, you know, bring others to really think about it and, and kind of connect the dots. You know, I'm, I'm going through this, why is it that, that they're not, right? I think that's one that's one thing that I can do myself. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Liz. I, I think I'm hearing that, right, the the power, power of shared experience, right, and then um, really initiating these, in, like, in meaningful conversations in your own, like, personal and interpersonal relationships. Um, yeah, I think that would be a really great action. I think, Karen, I saw you um, unmute yourself, but I'm not sure if I'm wrong, but please uh, welcome to the conversation. You know, um, just a comment. I think part of the collective action is practicing the conversation. I mean, you talked about culturally us being unable to voice some of those feelings, identify and label the feelings of what what is happening internally, externally. And I think having very public discussions about what those mean to each of us is something that we need to strengthen as a muscle. Um, that's, that's difficult. I mean, as I'm hearing your presentation, I am reminded of, you know, being strong, right? Trying to be strong and appear strong, but yet there's also that, that notion of making sure you're not putting all the light on yourself, right? Trying to stay in the background, um, and so trying to find that balance is very difficult, I would say, um, to many people. So I think just strengthening the muscle of speaking up, of being unafraid to be wrong in what it is you're commenting about, um, because what you feel is what you feel. Absolutely. I really appreciate that. So I'm wrapping up my doctoral studies in psychology, and I'm currently treating patients with trauma. And it's it's so powerful to see after, right, they're able to be in that vulnerable space. And even though they're kind of stumbling through it, how freeing it is to just be able to release, you know, the heaviness that they've carried, you know, for, from whatever they've experienced. So I absolutely want to echo that. Um, I think I see May and Pamela with their little hand emojis up. So um, if one of you wants to, yeah, give us a thought. Go ahead, Pamela. I, I want to make sure you have a chance to speak. Thank you. Um, I wanted to first say thank you so much for having um, this platform, first of all, because I think for a lot of people, this is, this is very new. This is not something that we're accustomed to discussing and we're accustomed to being, you know, just comfortable, at least for myself. I, this is completely different. But anyways, I wanted to as a mother of four boys, you know, um, at the very beginning of this pandemic and the, um, the news and reports of like the elderly Asians being attacked, you know, my, my eldest son was just like, what, 
mom, why are they attacking like, you know, quote unquote, old people? <laughs> and I just kind of, I, without even thinking, you know, I was just like, because they don't know if you're Bruce Lee or not. They don't know if you're going to attack them. They don't know what you're capable of. They don't know if you know any kind of martial arts. So maybe the older Asians are an easy target. And um, it, it was just kind of weird. I was like, I, I kind of reflected on my comment. And, you know, I, it wasn't so much as in jest. I think it came out of actually just this inner knowing as well. Like, well, he has a point. Why is it? Why are the elderly being attacked? And um, what was strange also, my son pointed out, well, at least in the news, what he's seeing is like, they're not being attacked by white people. So what's going on here? And I didn't have any answers for him. Um, I just told him, you know what, good observations. And I'm proud of you for, for keeping an open mind and um, being aware. And he's, a, a, I don't know, well, he, He's what, 24? I don't know if this is Gen, Gen Z, Gen Y, I, I don't know, millennial. But um, the other thing he mentioned <clears throat> was because, you know, his, his friends, his social group, you know, they're one of the other things he brought up was regarding the Asian women is why, why are they so hypersexualized? And it brought me back to a lot of things that I've experienced. And I just maintained my silence um, because it struck a chord with me and because it struck uh, a part of me that I have not discussed. And that was another um, uh, point of topic that I, I wasn't ready for, but it made me aware of it. Like, yeah, you know, I, I don't know if it's because I, you know, I'm from San Diego, we're a, huge, we're a military town. And, you know, I've experienced it. And so for my son to kind of bring that subject up, you know, for the women, why, why are Haitian women so hypersexualized? What is it with these, with these uh, men that, that view these Asian women as just like sexual objects? And it was a very sensitive subject for me. Um, I had no response to it, but maybe I thought, that would be also kind of going into the AAPI and the, um, the mental health part of it too, because I know that we're conditioned to really not, um, you know, keep your head down, bite your tongue, um, do what you need to do and don't rock the boat. Don't um, do X, Y, and Z. And um, yeah, so I, I, I kind of want to just uh, bring that to your attention and maybe see what your insight with it or anybody else who may have experienced that as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Pamela. I mean, I think that you touched on a lot of things and, you know, there are a lot of historical aspects of that, but I wanted to be really intentional about, right, like who is being attacked and who is the attacker. I think, right, like in these, in, in what has been happening, especially with Asian women and Asian elders, um, you are seeing folks that are societally viewed as more um, vulnerable be attacked, right? And so there is a common kind of rhetoric on who is being harmed. Um, but, you know, kind of in the interest of time, I think there's a lot of historical roots with that. And quite frankly, right, I think in terms of the identity of who is attacking API folks, it is all um, embedded within, right, white what like white supremacy and like racism and as I said which are hallmarkers of how this country was built and how it was meant to function right and so as opposed to examining the identity specifically of the attackers I think right it's a it's a really systemic issue um that is again like a it's a common thread right for um like oppressed and marginalized groups everywhere. And so I think, you know, that we don't have enough time um, today to discuss all of that, but I think that that would be a good place for, you know, learning to happen. Um, I'm gonna just go to our takeaways because I wanna be respectful of your time today. Um, but again, I wanted to touch on these like final points um, and hopefully, right, this is kind of the strong aspect, the, the collective aspect of us moving forward together as um, a community and as with allies as well. But again, we learned today, right, stigma has significant negative effects for API mental health on individual, communal and systemic levels. And this is tied and also perpetuates, tied to and perpetuates racial inequality at large. 
There's a greater need for mental health professionals who are trained in cultural competency. So even folks that uh, even clinicians that um, don't identify as API for them to also know, right, like some of the trends that we talked about today, what trauma looks like in the API community um, that can understand, you know, on a professional and clinical level and, you know, also personal levels too, if they do identify as API, um, the experiences and needs of the community and collection action is collective action is powerful. I think even the stories and, you know, what you, what was shared in this space today, again, was you know, profoundly meaningful to me um, in terms of, you know, how you all were digesting and coming to this space with your experiences and stories. Um, and it'll be, it, this is what will tie us down and give us a good foundation to even do, right, um, other action, like contacting your local representatives, um, accessing community resources, um, or really amazing people like Dorothy, right, and the work that she's doing, and, you know, countless others that are doing, doing, act, like, activi activist work um, for the API community. And I think these two, two points kind of touch on the, right, collective strength and identity. Um, it's choose empowerment over shame, right, and so, again, the, there's a commonality for all marginalized folks, Black folks, Latinx folks, right, LGBTQIA folks, API folks, Folks, that there is shame in our experiences. And um, I think to combat that is, is bravery. And it's, you know, being um, really grounded in who you are and the beauty of our community and all that we bring to the fabric of this nation um, that is able to right, give us kind of the sense of empowerment and, and the right to take up space with our stories and experiences and the right to feel protected and feel heard um, and feel known, right? And so, again, I think each of our individual and communal con contributions to that is the way that we move forward. Um, and, you know, any step, again, big or small, sharing in these kinds of spaces, sharing in, in your personal and interpersonal interactions um, is still a step forward. So, right, we're all kind of coming to um, together with one brick in hand, but, you know, those bricks together, I think we're a really strong wall against, right, some of these experiences that we um, have shared in together. Um, so that is kind of it. So I know, again, we're kind of running over time. So um, we'll hold off on questions. I think Liz said at the beginning that you can forward any questions to her. If there is any, if there are any that are directed to me, I think she'll be sending those my way. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Liz. But thank you so much, everybody, for for contributing today. Really appreciate it. Um, Hannah, I'm going to step in real quick, Liz, before you wrap everything up. First, thank you to everybody who participated today. Thank you so much for being brave and um, humble enough to share your experiences with us. It's a privilege to hear of your personal stories and backgrounds, as well as the steps that you've taken to contribute to not just this conversation, but um, the improvement and bettering of our community. So I love Jim's question about what, what does AAPI Strong look like? I think for us, we were very intentional about labeling this project as AAPI Strong instead of focusing on the anti-hate or the bias or the harassment or incidents of assault, because what we want at the end of this um, initiative is that we, we walk away with a better sense of what strength looks like for our communities. And we'll continue to unpack that in the in the lineup of events and trainings ahead of us. So this is only our second event, but I'm very encouraged by all the participation and the representation of different industries, because I think it's going to take more than a couple of organizations. It, it really will need to be a collective approach where all of us, regardless of whether we're from a business or a chamber background or mental health or um, nonprofit or government. I think it really requires leadership from so many of us from so many different backgrounds and sectors. So really appreciate all of you coming together to share and contribute to this important discussion. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to look at what are, what are steps we can take both for strengthening ourselves physically as well as mentally and in other ways. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, May. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for thank you, Hannah, for taking your time and, and educating us and increasing our awareness, you know, on the psychological impacts and the racial trauma experienced by the AAPI community. Um, you know, during this pandemic and even prior to the pandemic. Um, 
and for also providing pointers and recommendations, you know, for allies, for us to be able to deepen our understanding to better support and advocate for racial, racial justice. Um, but we, we have run out of time for Q&A, but, you know, I do want to say, please email me with any follow-up questions um, that I will filter through and, and have a response for all of you. Thank you again for your time. And Hannah, thank you again for your expertise. We've appreciated your time with us. Um, I also I would like to thank our sponsors, Verizon, East West Bank, pg &E and Ease, the MBDA Coronavirus Response and Relief Program, our Calasian Leadership, and our partner, partner National ACE. Thank you all for your support and your contributions to this initiative. And a quick reminder, um, today's session was recorded and will be shared post-conference as well as our News for Home video will be uploaded to our YouTube channel for you to be able to check out afterwards. Um, I'd also like to just remind again, um, any follow-up questions, please send them to me at emerced at calasiancc.org. And some event reminders, and join us for the upcoming event on March 30th. We will be having a situational awareness um, bystander training with OCA and the International Leadership Foundation. We also invite you to participate in our AAPI Strong Survey that will be prompted at the closing of this room. This survey serves as a safe space to share testimonies. Your responses will be, um, will be anonymous and kept confidential as well. So thank you again and have a great afternoon.